So next, um, I'd like to um, welcome Rachel Frizzell, uh, W2RUF, and she's going to be talking about the open closed, um, the statistical study of the open closed boundaries using ULF wave observations uh, from Antarctica Automated Geophysical Observatories, McMurdo Station, and South Pole Station. Now this is from, this is going to be coming from Antarctica, uh, but it has some potential application for what we're doing, uh, because as David just showed, uh, we do have interest in uh, that open closed boundary of as you go from the equator word area up into the pole word area across the auroral zone, the boundary uh, of open and closed magnetic field lines. Uh, Rachel's study is potentially interesting for the personal space weather station project because it shows a technique that you can use ground magnetometers for detecting that open closed boundary. So this is a potential method that we could use for the ground magnetometers in the personal space weather station um, instead of using it in Antarctica, using it up in say, Canada and the higher Arctic in the PSWSs that we deploy up there. So take it away, Rachel. All right, sorry for the technical difficulties. Can everyone hear me? Okay. Yes, do um, I'm going to talk about the statistical study of the open closed boundaries, um, referred to as OCBs using ULF wave observations from Antarctica Egos, McMurdo Station, and South Pole. Um, so to, to follow from the, the last talk, um, once again, I'm just going to talk a couple minutes about the open closed boundaries. Um, and this is very similar to what you saw on the last talk, um, defining the geo, um, the geographic North Pole, geographic South Pole, as you can see on the image on the left hand side. Um, you can see the magnetic field line as they originate in the South Pole and end in the North Pole. Once again, that boundary um, between those open and closed field lines is what I'm interested in right now. Um, and once again, the other image shows the uh, solar winds and um, the um, it's it's labeled once again it's open and closed boundary. So basically the Knowledge of the location and dynamic of the magnetic field open closed boundary provides insight to space physics processes such as substorms, particle precipitation events, and the magnetospheric configuration. Prior studies have shown that determination of the OCB location can be made by examining the ULF wave power and data from a latitudinal chain of ground based magnetometers extending from the rural zone deep into the polar cap. So the locations of these AGOs, um, here's a view from Antarctica. You can see AGO 5 is deep in the polar cap, and then um, AGO 5, 1, and 2 are along a similar line as with AGO 5, 4, and 3. Um, now, in part of my work was finding spectrograms during the cardinal quiet time months which I'll discuss shortly. But in order to determine the quiet time, um, there's a couple different measures. So one measure is DST, which is a measure basically of material injection. And then uh, KP is a measure of the magnetic field lines, a very unscientific ways to say how much they wiggle. Um, so what I did in order to find the quiet times of the cardinal dates, plus and minus 30 days, I would kick out um, any time of disturbance. So you can see there on the screen, the red circle shows some sort of disturbance. So I would not include that during the quiet time um, spectrograms. And once again, this is a three month. I'll be highlighting um, the time of 2017 and 2007. Um, and like I said, the, the cardinal months with 30 days plus or minus, that's why I'm showing the DST of those three months. Okay, so in order to determine the um, open closed signatures, a very simple way to imagine the open closed boundaries, if you take a guitar string, you clamp it at both ends and you pluck it, it vibrates. That's very similar to a closed field line. Now if you snip it, then it becomes an open field line and you're not going to see those ULF waves. So looking at these um, two figures, on the upper left is March 2017, it's AGO 5, which is deep in the polar cap. 
In the polar cap, you will expect to see the open field lines. Um, so once again, there's no signature of the waves. Now, if you look at AGO3, that shows some sort of signature of the UF waves. Um, and I also, in my charts, as I mentioned before, you can see uh, the x-axis is MLT time and the y is period in minutes. Um, AGO3, L is approximately 10, and for AGO5, L is approximately 300. L is defined as um, basically the equator distance out from the Earth. And we also are beginning to see the blue dotted line in the lower right hand figure shows the um, swooping U. And the swooping U is from the day night variation. So, one, so continuing on about the swooping U pattern, um, once again, the two figures, the one in the upper left is AGO3 from September 2017. And as I might not have mentioned, these are the spectrograms of the quiet times of plus or minus 30 days around the equal nux or solstice. So 30 days before September 22nd, 30 days after. Um, now we can see more ULF build variability along the swooping new patterns. So if we take a look at the AGO3 of September 2017, the um, black lines are the standard deviation. So we notice right around the swooping U pattern, we see the standard deviation is about 0.4 and it's, it's higher there um, than it is uh, more at like hour 20. So like I said, we see the, the variability, uh, the UF built var variability along the swooping U patterns. And the cause of that is thought to be from the polar cap variations. So the next slide, I'm going to talk about the um, greater ULF energy is observed at the lower magnetic latitude sites um, during equinox condition. So first to explain this slide here, on the left-hand side is demonstrates equinox and the right-hand side is a solstice. So beginning at the upper left-hand side, we have March, then below that is September. Those are two equinoxes. And then on the other side of the screen is the solstice of June and followed by December. Um, so we can, so with that said, we see the greater ULF energy is observed at the lower magnetic latitude sites during equal NOx condition. So if we look at the equal NOx condition, that has higher variability than the solstice. Uh, we speculate this is associated with the enhanced magnetosphere ionosphere coupling efficiencies associated with the dipole tilt, uh, which is the angle between the geomagnetic dipole axis and the geocentric solar um, magnetosphere, uh, the z-axis. Through the exact physical mechanism of this cup coupling is open, it is reasonable to assume that enhanced UF energy on closed field lines would be associated with enhanced solar wind coupling. These next two slides are a bit of an eye chart, um, and they are similar in the fact that we have the solar minimum from 2017, and a solar minimum happens every 10 years. It will be the solar minimum of 2007 on the next slide. The way these are organized are by my magnetic latitude. So we have the higher magnetic, to, magnetic latitude at the top of the screen and the lower magnetic latitude at the bottom. So AGO5 is at the highest magnetic latitude, and AGO2 is at the lowest. Um, up, going from left to right, we have spring, hemisphere winter, fall, and southern hemisphere summer. Um, and these are the quiet time ULF climatologies during the cardinal months. Now, there seems to be greater variability in the ULF data on the dusk midnight section. So let me take another step back and explain this a little more because there's a lot going on in these next two slides. Um, so a couple of things that are overlaid on this slide. I also use the Siganinko model. Um, I use Siganinko 89 um, and 
I, I had a couple little issues with it. Um, it worked well for 805, so a X at the bottom of the screen means it was a um, open field line. Um, and then, once again, I apologize for the eye chart, a little harder to see at the bottom of the screen. Um, a absence of an X would indicate a, um, a closed field line. Um, and then I'm going to flip to the next slide, which is a solar minimum. And I went from 2006 to 2009. There was um, some missing data, so I had to pull data from a couple different years. And once again, we see greater UF energy is observed at the lower magnetic latitude sites during the equinox condition due to the dipole tilt. So in conclusion, um, we were able to use spectrograms to determine the OCBs from the magnet magnetometer data. Um, now, to reiterate from Nathaniel's introduction, one advantage why this is so, one reason um, this talk is important to HAMS and particularly the personal space station is by including magnetometers, um, if with the magnetometers in the personal space station, if they are deployed up through Canada, then we can have a better idea of those areas of the open closed boundaries. Um, so in terms of my work with looking at the ones in the Antarctica, um, bearing iridium transmission issues and ego power system concerns, this technique shows great potential for locating the OCBs all year long with an array of relatively simple instruments. Um, the greater UF energy is observed at the lower magnetic latitude sites during equinox conditions, and we see more variability at the dusk midnight section, uh, likely due to ULFs as seen in uh, Matt Cooper's paper 2019. Um, that's my last slide, and there's probably some time for questions. Thank you so much, Rachel. I really appreciate it. See, are there any questions for Rachel? I, I want. I wanted to ask how the feature set of the magnetometer that we've uh, laid out um, compares to those that you're talking about using um, in testing. Uh, are we covering the same features or are there other things that we should be looking into? Can you please repeat that question? Um, my microphone, my, I could not hear that. Okay, I'm sorry. Um, I hope you can hear me. Uh, I wondered how the magnetometers that we are, um, uh, that we're looking at making for the personal state, uh, the space weather station, um, compare in features to the professional ones um, that you have perhaps used uh, in the past for these measurements? Um, I, I don't have those specs on what the magnetometer capabilities would be for the personal uh, space station. I can jump in there for a minute uh, to help out if you want. Um, they're going to be, they'll be similar. Uh, certainly the ones that uh, Rachel has been using, they're actually the same magnetometers that uh, Hyoman uses as part of the NJIT team. Uh, one of the main differences is they're going to be more sensitive in terms of uh, nanotesla detection. So they'll be able to detect, you know, fractions of a nanotesla instead of, say, have a 10 nanotesla resolution. Now, in terms of the type of work that Rachel's doing, I think that um, there are certain ULF waves, and that's what Rachel's looking at here, ultra low frequency waves. There are certain ULF waves that will be big enough that the personal space weather station magnetometer will be able to detect. Um, as you get farther away from the um, auroral zone and the ULF waves get smaller, um, the personal space weather station will be less sensitive to it. But I, I do believe that even with the 10 nanotesla resolution, we will be able to detect a certain, uh, certain amount of ULF waves. Well, just to add, uh, what Rachel was showing was mo mainly high latitude phenomena. And we are talking about, I guess, mid or la low latitude phenomena. So, I mean, it's not totally different regime, but basically what we're trying to measure is going to be a little bit different from what uh, Rachel was reporting because that's very high latitude phenomena. So in terms of wave activity, in terms of the amplitude of wave activity, 
uh, the spatial extent would be different. So we are not trying to do the same thing that uh, Rachel is trying to do. Although, I mean, this, the conceptually, this is very similar. Well, I think one of the things is when we've been framing the personal space weather station project, we've constantly been thinking in terms of design of the mid latitude region. And that's because that's where most of the people in the United States live and most of the people um, in involved in this project live. However, we are getting we are starting to see involvement from amateur radio operators up in Canada and up in uh, the high Arctic. Uh, in Canada and up in Alaska as well. And some of those people, I've had more than one uh, person from Alaska or Canada come to me and say, you know, we want to put up a personal space weather station too. You know, we're interested in this. So for those people, this particular technique could potentially be useful. Great point. Um, Sorry, yeah. Nathaniel, I've got one more quick question before I know we have to move on. Um, Shuling uh, Shi from the, the uh, chat said, um, Rachel, can you clarify how you, uh, you determine open and closed boundaries using ULF power spectra? So if you have like just a brief statement, just repeating what you had said at the beginning about how you define the boundaries. Uh, Rachel, can't hear you. I would look at the um, spectrograms. So basically looking at one of those eye charts, um, when I saw the presence, because there's that gray region um, of like AGO5 is always going to be open, but it's that gray area of like the AGO23 that it shifts. So I would look for the presence of the ULF wave seeing that for lack of a better word, that like red blur. Right, so Rachel, when you see that red blur. Yeah, hold on, yeah. Rachel, uh, when you see that red blur, um, that means that it's uh, a closed field line if you see the red blur? Correct, correct. A closed field line, you're going to see that red blur. That's going to be the ULF weight. Right, and the reason for that is um, when, you have a, you, when you have a closed field line, it's of a particular length, so it can resonate with a certain frequency, just like if you have a guitar string stretched across a guitar, you pluck it, it can resonate since it's got that, that tension, those nodes. So same thing here, a closed field line, it is able to support the resonance of frequencies, and that's when you see that ULF wave activity there. And just like Nathaniel mentioned, if you have, if you have you know, uh, magnetometers at high latitude region with more uh, densely spaced uh, uh, configuration, then you should be able to see this type of OCB change of temporal change of OCB in more detail. So that's our hope. I don't, yes. don't see any more. I don't see any more questions, but uh, that was great. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Rachel. And thank you. Thank you for everyone's questions.